All right, let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dead Horse Podcast. This is Tejas hosting today because I can. And uh, with me, I have Vivek. Hey, guys. And Arvind. Hello. So today, we're going to be talking first about Broken Age because Arvind and I have played it. And Vivek is currently playing it. And so we figured, you know, why not talk about it? Because hell, everybody else is, and we need to jump on this train before it leaves. So, Arvind, what do you think of the game? Yeah, I think it's okay. Like, it's a good, uh, decent game, but yeah, it's not, it's disappointingly not the second coming of Tim Schafer and the golden age of LucasArts adventures. <laughs> kind of disappointing. But yeah, it's a good game. Well, I, I enjoyed the art, I enjoyed the writing. I found the puzzles to be a little, you know, too convoluted. I mean, I know adventure games don't always have, like, you know, the most uh, probably uh, great puzzles, I guess you could say, because the puzzles aren't really the core of the experience. They kind of support it. But generally, you're supposed to feel kind of smart after you finish or you solve a puzzle. Uh, with Broken Age, I think one of the biggest issues I had was just it felt more annoying that I had to keep jumping through all these loopholes to get something done uh, instead of you know being like yeah this is how I do it. I mean I think there yeah, was only... there's no yeah there's yeah. no room for inventiveness. Like there's just like you know you have one item in your inventory and like there's just just this one thing that's blocking your progress. So you naturally just like take that one item and use it on the other. Right, so the biggest issue I had with the puzzles was that it didn't match uh, the logic of the game world that they were uh, creating sometimes. You know, it felt very one-dimensional, or it felt very forced. The reason I am picking up this item is because of this, or the reason I need to do these or so many steps is because of this. It it just felt very canned. So, or... So that that did kind of annoy me a little bit, especially because sometimes I actually had to go to a walkthrough and be like, okay, how the fuck am I going to go through this? Because I didn't have the patience to try and figure it out because I just knew that there was no game logic I could employ to my benefit. So in that sense, it was quite annoying. But that being said, the writing and voice acting and the art are just fucking beautiful, man. Yeah, the, the art, art is pretty good. Yeah, no the doubt. Art is like something it's... else. Yeah, uh, I think like actually painting. like uh, uh, an opportunity was missed to have lots of interactions that don't really uh, do anything. For example, grabbing Gary. You have grabbing yeah. Gary since the start of the game, basically. And like the only time it is actually used is when like that arbitrary machine with four knobs comes in. So exactly. instead of like, it should have been something in the middle, like grabbing Gary could have done something with the knives in the kitchen. Or like, you know, some miscellaneous interactions that don't uh, do anything, but actually like just provide some humor or something. Because uh, as know, it but... was, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, what I'm finding very uh, interesting is the fact that you actually remember the robot's name. Like I'd have just been like, remember the robot with the four arms? And you're like, no, grabbing Gary. Yeah. That was his name. Good yeah. on you. <laughs> yeah, so... No, like the characters and all that are well written. So like, but the problem is that there's just nothing else. Like there's not even a look button, which I find very weird. Like, like a look button is so important. Like it's like, you know, it it provides a lot of uh, like personality and perspective to the game. Here you just have to click on stuff. So it's clearly made for an iPad. Like that's pretty obvious. Yeah. But yeah, like. Yeah, like just one of these days we'll get a game that's on iPad and on the PC and the the PC version wasn't like bastardized to make it fit <laughs> on the iPad. Yeah. That's going to get, you know, that's going to be a little difficult though. I mean, you know, when you have like maybe one or two controls to work with, uh, you know, like the PC version has to be, you know, at least input method wise, very simple, which is of course why these guys, you know, were like, okay, let's... Uh, Let's be very easy on uh, how many interactions we allow. Because if, you know, the whole list of interactions is not something, you know, a new age audience would like. Of course, that being said, that is not exactly what people funded. Yeah. 
yeah even while playing this like it this doesn't feel that much like a proper old school adventure game it feels like a it feels like they're trying to do something new mm-hmm. which is cool but i don't think that they're well so far they're not succeeding i also it doesn't help that i'm playing this without any music or uh, audio think, or uh no like i think it's 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 like if you just see a single frame it's pretty evocative of the old school adventure games the problem is the lack of uh, like you know uh, any like m- interactions beyond uh, the ones that just progress the game in some way mm. i mean there's like a handful of interactions there that don't actually progress the game it's like uh, they're just kind of there you know like you know uh more more often than not you're just clicking on things to get the bit, get bits of story so you know at the end of the day you, you it's you're almost asking yourself why didn't i just you know th- they could have just added an auto play mode where they play all the dialogues in sequence or something <laughs> you just and make an animated movie and stuff but no more, no more or less it it almost feels yeah. like you know that could be a viable option at this point yeah uh and yeah another problem was that like there was no actual like uh, difficult puzzles as such it was just like yeah like they just said this earlier but yeah it was just like you have this object and yeah it's pretty straight forward so like the, like with adventure games it's so tough i mean that's that's why the legendary adventure game designers get their paychecks right because you can either make it too easy or you can make it so complicated that it like hurts your head trying to think about it i don't think it can be so complicated i think there should be there there has to be a middle ground that you can yeah you know, like that's exactly like the middle ground is what like the the like these people are experts at you know right i mean for hard adventure games just look at what sierra made like some of the games sierra made where like if you miss something like mix miss clicking on a pixel and then 3 hours later you die because of that <laughs> yeah, that's the m- more difficult stuff <laughs> that's it. i i can see that but i don't know like broken broken age for like all the hype it, it's not a bad game that that's not what i'm trying to get at it's just you know i i think people were generally just disappointed with uh you know how it turned out um there's also you know the fact that you know they did make a lot of money and you know they're you know it, when you get like a campaign that i think you could finish in uh two hours i uh, i finished in no, about two think... two and a half no uh, like it, it took me four or five hours or something like two hours is probably just for one this thing i mean no, unless no. you just like uh like got everything right the first time like two hours yeah is... i did like... i didn't kind of uh okay i'm looking at my steam page and it says i have 3 hours played on that game of which i'm sure 15 minutes is me going to check uh, walkthroughs because i was a little annoyed with uh you know not knowing where to go mm. so for me yeah. i think it took 5 hours yeah like and i basically just like i was kind of like clicking everything and like doing everything like to like find out the mini interactions and stuff Yeah there aren't any dude like I tried doing that in the beginning and it became very apparent very quickly that they don't have that so you know yeah. I was just like whatever and then I just started playing the you know uh you mouse over stuff and at the po- you know you realize that okay this is something I can interact with so you run a quick uh you look through each screen see what you can interact with and then just kind of push uh push on so that that's what I ended up doing yeah Uh Vivek, I know you're still playing it, but uh Yeah, yeah. How how are you feeling about it so far and what part are you on? Uh I just solved that first dumb puzzle where uh, you find the knife and now I'm going to be fed to Mok Chotra. Uh oh shit, I hated that thing about you have to trade like three times and then you get Oh wait, is this wait, which knife? Uh Oh you the knife. You find the knife. Yeah yeah I'm just at the beginning very oh, very that, big oh way beginning oh. okay yeah yes. because there's this like yeah there's actually more than one knife <laughs> yeah 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 and and like the resolution of this thing too so like you know like spoiler alert but like the resolution of the vela thing it's just like the like oh, hey there's this weapon that you can use like that just <laughs> came out of nowhere like i don't know yeah 
it was very uh, Deus Ex Machina. It was like it just yeah, this is the thing. I but yeah, but if you played uh, Bella first and then you played uh, Shay, then you realize that okay, um, there's a setup on you know associated. Yeah, I mean, I play I played Shay's campaign first. And like within like about 40, 40, 30, 40 minutes, I knew what Vela's thing was supposed to be because I was alternating almost okay. uniformly. So I knew what the twist was beforehand. Well, yeah, the, the twist wasn't really, you know, like, oh my God, that's so shocking. It yeah. wasn't something like that. Uh, you can you, tell me the twist. I don't mind. Like, you don't have to. Uh, no, no, it's fine, dude. You should like, you know, have, yeah. uh, we'll let you figure out. But like for, at least for me, like, I think I played uh, Shay first. No, I played Vela first. I played Vela first. And I think half, like about halfway through her segment, I'm like, oh, okay, this is what it's going to turn out to be. Yeah. And that's pretty much what it was. So, you know, big surprise. Uh, okay. Like the twist I'm assuming is how the two worlds are connected? Uh, We'll let you get to it, dude. Okay. Because, you know, nobody, yeah, it's best you just kind of experience it. We'll see how you react because... That way we kind of see, you know, what your take on everything is as well. But, you know, moving on. Um, oh, actually, no, wait, before we move on, uh, you, we did mention that, you know, this thing is uh, coming out to different platforms and stuff, right? So, yeah. um, you know, how, how, how do you s- perceive, you know, pl- you know uh, people who generally play uh, on iPads and Androids and whatnot, how do you think they're going to be like, uh, do you think they're going to enjoy the game or yeah, see it? Sure. Or... Like, I mean, it's a pretty uh, simple game, doesn't need a lot of uh, like dexterity or like it, the inputs aren't time sensitive. So I think like pretty much anyone can pick up this game and enjoy it. And plus right. the interactions just amount to like, you know, single click somewhere. So like, I think it's pretty much the simplest game like one of the simplest games you could make and like it it's pretty enjoyable like like i think anyone can enjoy it hmm, nice i uh, you know i also you know figured that that would allow me to segue very handily into our next bit where we just kind of talk about uh free to play games and what you guys think of it because i am now working in a free to play studio so my perception of how you know they work and what goes into them is slowly changing. Hey, somebody hired Tejas. Like, wow, that, that's, a, that's insane. <laughs> I think we established that a podcast or two ago when I actually told everyone that, yes, I now have a job. But yes, Whoa. thank you, Arvind. I feel yeah. so special. <laughs> but, wow, Vivek, you're really, really quiet right now. I'm play- Sorry, I'm in the middle of this Mok Chatra pu- puzzle. <laughs> oh like all, there's that the four of you it's, guys in a row yeah oh crap uh, yeah, yeah 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 you've got to i'm like i'm trading stuff with these people i don't yeah. know yeah that's kind of what i started uh talking about a moment ago saying that you know this that puzzle gets really annoying really fast at least to me i was just like come on seriously this is this is yeah. you know I have to, uh, you're making well, me it seems this. to me that the trick is to basically get the buzzer to pick you out. Yeah, like no, th- that's the thing. Like what you have to do is immediately apparent, but the hoops you have to jump through to you know to actually do that is annoying. And that's one thing I don't like is that when I when I figure something out, the steps to complete it should be you know shouldn't be so difficult where they're in and of themselves like you know a challenge like, yeah like i don't really just, have is it just me or or uh, you know does it actually seem right now that like these puzzles are basically trial and error you keep trying as many options as you can yeah until something works yeah that's pretty much it yeah you don't lose any points for not getting it right yeah that's actually one thing because like i would rather there's no added bonus like there's a few interactions where characters say something funny if you try to interact with different things but otherwise generally it's not even very uh, free form and that's it like it's just like the game is pretty good like if it if this game did not have the whole uh, kickstarter baggage and tim shaper's triumphant return with it we would be pretty okay with it but yeah since it it has that whole weight of expectations so that creates the the disappointment that we have 
I I don't think it's entirely that either. I mean, even, I, okay, I haven't played any of Telltale's games, so I, I I can't make that comparison. But I do see it as you know, if if I picked up this game, I would my reaction would be more or less the same. Is that you know, it's a great story, but I'm practically playing a story and not really a game at this point. So yeah, that that's pretty much where I stand with uh, with. Uh, yeah, they just broken. you should play this game called Gone Home. I'm sure you will. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> I, it's really my type of game. I know, you know, that that is probably <laughs> something I just be like, yeah, no. Yeah, no, because like that, like I I don't have the that problem. Like, okay, this is not really a game. Like the problem I have is just like you know, I, I sort of expected more from it. It's a pretty good game. That I don't, yeah, like I don't, I don't ever think my problem is this is not a game. This is like I think it's. Uh, my problem generally is how much can I engage with this or how much am I engaging with this experience? Yeah. Uh, this is is super charming. The visuals are freaking amazing for yeah. Broken Age. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, like the the puzzles, uh, even the, the this mock chatra puzzle which I just solved is is really dumb. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't even seem like Tim Schafer adventure game puzzle. Like you know, it's not even. It's not complicated, and I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind the complicated, dumb puzzle where you have to figure out how to mix two inventory items to get what you need to do. This just seems like uh, try everything you can until something works. You know, more or less. Yeah. And uh, when I said that it's not a game, it's not like you know I'm being. Uh, well, I'm trying to think of the right word, but no, I'm not being elitist about you know it not being a game. But generally, like I, I felt like the interactions were just. It's like you said, you're just trial and erroring it. At that point, you're not really playing, you're just kind of following a storyline. Uh, and that's, you know, after a point that gets boring, you know, it's like I said earlier, is that, uh, you know, they could have very well just had an autoplay button, and I would have loved watching it. I'd have loved watching it play out. But just none of the pointless running around trying to figure out where to go or what item to use where, or where to get the item you need for the next challenge. Okay, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much our uh, opinion on Broken Age, promising, but like kind of let down by the weight of expectations and lack of depth in general. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting Grim Fandango, man. Uh, <laughs> And and I, I don't know, like to start out with the setting does seem to be that promising. The setting is, is amazing. Oh, the setting is pretty cool, and you know, I I, I kind of thought that I, I like both settings, but I think uh, uh, I, my takeaway from it was that uh, Shay uh, Shay's world and all was very contained, but his puzzles were a bit better, or at least his story. Well, maybe not his puzzles, but his story was a little bit more focused. And with Vela, her the characters involved in her story were just really amazing. But yeah, Vela also seems to be a much more sprawling, epic kind of thing. I, I the... like, yeah, I like Vela's story better. Like Shay's, the main problem is that, uh, like there is this initial loop where you are stuck in a routine. So the problem is that, like the game, since it doesn't want to annoy you by repeating over and over again, the game basically frees you from the routine by itself. Like, yeah, there is there isn't even any effort required on your part. You just have to keep on following. Until the game is like, hey, did you see that boring routine? Now you are free from it, kind of thing. So that that felt like sort of weird. It was like if you did not want me to uh, like engage in this routine, then why did you like do all of that stuff? I don't know. Like I just felt like either it needed more initiative from the player to break away from the routine, or it would, or it just needed to establish that and move on quicker. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think like ultimately, yeah, like yeah, it's that it's that problem. Like the expectations are so high, and like this is another problem. Like what I said, like I I think I, in in a, another episode I had mentioned that this would have been much better if like it would it was just one story and like that had more stuff in it. I think the problem here was that like Tim Schafer was successful even before he wrote the initial story and everything, so he didn't have to go through the whole vetting process and kind of thing. Which some which sometimes helps. The, this game was basically mega successful before the first thing was written. So Tim Schafer never had to like, uh, like get his ideas vetted. Like, okay, the, have you tried doing this? Have you tried doing that? 
right. i think sometimes that helps like in the pro- especially in the case of like adventure games where like it's basically all of that is just the puzzles and the plot and everything yeah but i like again i don't know how much of the puzzle design in this game is tim shaper i think he's doing all the writing i don't yeah. know that he's designing the puzzles yeah i, I don't sure see he is him, because uh... uh like he uh, like the workflow which like double fine has at least posted is that tim shaper basically outlines the entire game like the entire scenario slash scene and then the team members have one day to give feedback to him and then one tim day. shaper yeah and then tim shaper uh, uh see what takes whatever feedback he likes modifies the game and then they start implementing it so from the looks of it tim shaper does all the the writing and puzzle design uh but that's see, the, that's yeah. insane for a game this big Yeah, like, I don't think it's that big actually. The... Like, like narratively speaking, most of the effort is not on Tim Shaper. Like the story isn't exactly like uh, War and Peace, is it? Like, it's pretty simple. One person can well, e- easily like keep track of one it. One person, and... one person can write all that dialogue, but one person cannot write all that dialogue and be responsible for designing all the puzzles. Right. So I actually do like. like it's going to affect quality i mean if that's the case then uh, it's understandable why they've made the puzzle so simplistic yeah i, mean, yeah. I guess but like i didn't even think like it, like most adventure games are actually written and done by one person like like for example yeah, but dave a, gilbert yeah. with like his blackwell games so hmm i mean it's not like yeah but black, look at the look at the scope of blackwell blackwell i'll tell you why it works because blackwell is a very set kind of episodic formula right there are certain mechanics that exist in that blackwell right he's not writing uh, he's not always writing just simply contextual puzzles the the hook of blackwell is there's a ghost and there is a main character and the ghost and the main character can communicate with each other right yeah so most of the puzzles revolve around that that's why blackwell works you know yeah but like let like yeah i'm but, i'm not but um, there's but there are a lot of contextual puzzles you get what i'm saying yeah no, a lot no, of puzzles, what i mean is that like i don't think like the like the story in in this game is lackluster because it is one person writing it i think tim shaper has way like enough credentials and experience to handle a story of this size like i think the problem here is that like he has basically uh, like the last word in everything game. yeah the last word in everything so he doesn't have to vet his ideas as uh, stringently as he might have had to do it when he was writing grim fandango or something yeah sure. i agree I, I, that's that's kind of what i, I was about to say i also that think that kind of... for a team it might be really hard to go up to tim shaper and say that this sucks <laughs> yeah <laughs> can you imagine someone at double fine going up to him and saying hey like it's a really cool idea and everything but i don't think you're implementing it well i think they i mean it. there was one person but he kind of left like <laughs> But yeah, like he's the boss. Tim Shaper is the boss. Cool. Like, nobody can actually say it anyway. Like, even cool. if it was like Ron Gilbert. So. Oh. Oh, Ron. Yes. But Ron Gilbert, I don't think ever said that. Uh, I don't think he was around long enough to say that uh, DF Double Fine Adventures sucked. No, I think like 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 they they when he was leaving, like they they broadcast a thing where Ron Gilbert was like, uh, like he played an early build of Broken Age, and he was like. he said i like this and this uh so then tim shaffer was like okay cool and then he 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 bit, got a huge stack of papers saying i didn't like this <laughs> oh <laughs> which was very funny yeah well, but i mean there again like i remember the i i, I saw that video the video that you're talking about uh, yeah. they did that in the documentary but like yeah. i mean that was a long way before uh, yeah that was way back yeah and that being said the other thing also is that it's the first half of a game So you know the game is not done. I've I've heard that the ending is pretty cliffhangery. Yeah, game. it is very cliffhangery, and it, that's that's the other yeah. thing is that you know you had this much cash, you could have just finished the product and put it out there. I don't understand yeah, no, no, why. Yeah, no, no. See, this is this is this is not like that. Is the one thing that doesn't surprise me that they have gone massively over budget. Is the one thing that didn't doesn't surprise me. Like, is the one thing I was afraid of when people started contributing money to it willy nilly. because tim shaffer the one thing that's well known and documented about the guy is that he has no idea how to budget and he has no idea how to scope yeah like the, he once the money started coming in i think just khushi khushi mein these guys 
he came up with an idea and these guys were like whoa this is awesome let's do it and then they started doing it and they had <laughs> I, they like literally they had no idea oh shit this is so big and yeah. and that that comes through even in the documentary like you know it, it's only towards yeah. the end that they start realizing how massive the scope of what they've undertaken for the amount of money they have is they run yeah. out of money towards yeah, the end Shifter has a habit of like doing this right like I mean, I don't want to say that like like I know what Tim Schafer does wrong or anything, but like broken like brutal legend, psychonauts. This is a yeah, common so pattern with his games, right? The only thing, the only thing is he generally delivers in like he delivers all six cylinders firing, right? The only difference again this time is that he doesn't have the kind of budget he's usually used to working with. The guy is usually used to working with like a twenty thirty million dollar budget. Oh, like that? That's insane. Like, did he make full throttle on that much money? Like, I'm amazed. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm talking about the uh, modern games that he's made for, for okay. Psychonauts and stuff like that. <coughs> yeah. You know, Psychonauts, Brutal Legend, and stuff like that. All of those have been made on very, very good budgets. Hmm. But uh, this, uh, this, this game has like a, a fifth of those budgets, right? So for double fine, like, and for Schaefer also, he thinks that what he's delivering is like very high value for money. He is yeah. delivering what he would probably consider the triple A quality Tim Schaefer adventure game at uh, whatever. What's it priced at now? Twenty dollars. Mm. Is it twenty dollars just for part one or for both? No, no, just for part one. Oh god damn. Twenty five dollars. Wow. Yeah. So that's like right. a full fifty dollar game once you get the entire. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's going to be a full fifty dollar game. Like, oh no, Act Two conclusion will arrive as a free update. So twenty five bucks for both. Okay, yeah, twenty five bucks for both. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, we were wrong. Yes. Okay, that's that's good of them. You know. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, like I, I'd, I'd say the art alone, the art alone makes this value for money as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah, it looks beautiful and the dialogues are great. Yeah. So. You know, it's just that the interaction bit is. Uh, yeah, they lacking. got pretty heavy hitters too, like for the dialogue, like. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean except the part where like Will Wheaton plays Will Wheaton, because I'm kind of getting like, sort of saturated with Will Wheaton everywhere, so like <laughs> no fault of that guy. Like I think he's pretty cool, but like but... because the guy just plays sort of himself, in every. What, is, what else is he in? What? What else is he in? Like uh, other than the. Star Trek: The Next Generation. What else is Will Wheaton in? No, he's uh, got all these uh, YouTube uh, things. Yeah, that he YouTube does, channels right? and stuff. Yeah, and like and like the couple of Big Bang Theory episodes which I watched. Oh God, why are you watching Big Bang Theory? It I, I was when I was in college, but like those episodes just like sort of are burned in my head. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Community is a better show. Yeah, yeah. I I I heard that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I heard the uh, new seasons weren't that good. The fourth season of Community is not that great. The fifth season is them back in form again. Oh, okay. The creator of the show was fired for the fourth season. They hired him back for the fifth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so okay. Let's move on to the yeah that, yeah okay yeah I think this Broken Age is kind of like we have just we are going back again. Yeah. Which was, like, yeah. We just keep going. Tim Schafer is still great. I mean. Uh, even a bad Tim Schafer game is still a pretty great game. Yeah, <laughs> that's that, yeah. It, that has to be said in perspective, you know. Yeah, like it's a, it's a like that's what I was saying. Uh, like re- removed all the expectations and stuff from it, and like at the price which I got, fifteen dollars. This is a great game. Yeah, absolutely. I got it for fifteen. So like same here. Yeah, like at twenty five, I would say, eh, wait, wait till it gets to fifteen. But well, at 15, 25, I'd say wait I for the second part to come out. Yeah. You know, because yeah, then it's just great value for money. Because if I, I, an eight-hour game, if this is just half of the game, yeah. an eight-hour game for 25 bucks is fantastic value for money. Yeah, I, I really want to see how this ends before I make like a final, final verdict saying that yes, I really enjoyed or didn't. Like yeah, that, because that's... It's, it is meant to be one big story, right? Yeah. Oh, I hope oh. it does. Better. And speaking of Kickstarter projects, have you guys uh, heard, uh, seen or heard of Darkest Dungeon? I have yeah. heard of it. Yeah, I have heard of it. I'm really interested in their whole affliction system. Like, I, like at least what they've talked about so far seems kind of cool. 
I've always, I've always, uh, when, when, when I, when I played XCOM, I always wanted a, like a, yes. a, a <laughs> so that whenever the soldiers come in with PTSD, you have to counsel them and like, you know, put them through uh, therapy so that they can go back into the field again. Dude, we've uh, talked about this before. We, we went like, you know, full psych ward and, you know, like, yeah, all kinds yeah. of different... if you could mix, if you could mix something like this with the nemesis system, wherein a oh, particular yeah. kind of alien is uh, that nemesis kind of system alien. is actually uh, <laughs> yeah I mean that 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 feels kind of overblown like I'm I can bet that like in the final game this turns out to be kind of half baked the, like, the nemesis system. yeah from yeah, that yeah. But I mean, Assassin's I'm Creed about, LOTR I'm that. talking from a high concept point of view in a systemic way if you could have like a nemesis for a character and if you could mix that with this affliction system where people have phobias and stuff like that and if you could make a pl- a player character scared of a certain kind of enemy mm-hmm. uh, or a person in a squad scared of a certain kind of enemy how how amazing would that be in dude, XCOM dude it, what if in XCOM instead of being afraid or instead of just being afraid of a different enemy uh, the nemesis system also applies to allies so where you know allies are like oh wait in that last battle this sniper just kept missing everything I don't trust him so he's yeah, yeah, like yeah. more prone to panic when that sniper is behind him and there's tons that of would be a, a very ton of interesting, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think in XCOM what, what that would turn out is that after four or five missions, everyone is just pissed off at everyone else. Because More or less. <laughs> they have missed and you have to mix shorts, and match yeah. a, mix and match uh, squads more so that you have a squad where everyone is at least on a neutral basis with each other. Yeah. As opposed to eating the guts out of each other. Yeah. <laughs> Though, although, like, ultimately in XCOM, why that might not make sense is because you would be like, come on, guys, like, let's put our differences behind while aliens are trying to eradicate yeah, but I mean, the human uh, race. Like, I, uh, I don't know if, you, so, if you've seen Battlestar Galactica, uh, but, uh, you know, in that also, the human race is being annihilated while aliens are, because Cylons are uh, keep murdering everyone. And even even then, we find ways to fuck with each other. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know. I think that uh, that's just human, right? Like the the ability to kind of, you know, even though the odds are so overwhelming and there's no option but to unite, the personal thing is always a factor. The individual, uh, I I think it adds more drama to the whole thing. Yeah, it's good. Like it adds the narrative element that that's kind of missing in XCOM now. Yeah, yeah, makes it sense. Maybe that, that's what the second expansion pack will be like. <laughs> oh God, I, I hope so. Oh, anyone if, if, if any if they actually do that i i'm i'm probably gonna go nuts with xcom again like i probably uh-huh. won't surface for a month what whatever they do whatever they do we're all gonna go nuts with xcom again yeah yeah that's true man uh, has, has arvin played enemy with it yeah i finished it yeah okay what did you think yeah it's pretty good like like though, although like now the balance has kind of shifted too much into the humans. Yeah. Favor. Yeah, it's it's insane how easy it becomes post mid game. Uh, yeah. Like the only t- time it actually kind of becomes hard is like if you screw up so bad that one of your mechs dies. Like that's if yeah. you get uh, get one a couple of your mechs killed, that's when it gets harrowing. But if that's you manage hard. to keep your yeah, like that's that's pretty difficult to do. If you manage to keep yeah, uh, like a couple of your mechs, get get them to kernel, that's pretty much like game set and match. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I have like I, I'm at I don't know I'm close to end game right now. I have nine kernel. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's that's basically like uh, like that's pretty much what you get if you just like keep on like saving, reloading. Because yeah, yeah, nine, yeah. yeah that's like the, I, I have saves, saves come the shit out of. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah i do plan to like have class yeah like i i have not played it on classic iron man so far i played it on normal iron man and i played it on classic, classic right? and like it not on... saves coming so yeah like i have to see how that goes yeah. i'm playing it on classic saves come right now okay i'm basically playing it uh, on classic with uh all the second wave options on so yeah but i generally try to make sure i don't you know uh save and reload too uh too often you know uh i only do that when i have like this complete whitewash and i don't want to lose someone otherwise i let it go so i have about like you know 
15 to 20 deaths so far. I only lose someone when like, you know, it's been, it's a really, really epic kind of death. Mm-hmm. That's when I say, okay, fine. This is deserved. Die now. Uh, <laughs> this is this is too epic for me to like not let this happen. Uh, yeah. You deserve to die. Yeah. Darkest Dungeon looks really promising. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like uh, strangely enough, like I am not sure if like they have a demo available. Like, all, are all those all of those gifs like uh, like no, prototype think... kind of shots or uh, is that yeah, actual? I... I think it's actual gameplay because somewhere in that text they say that they've been working on this for nine months already and oh. they've been self-funded for nine months and now they're looking to, you know, get more funding to actually, you know, go on with it. Oh. Put the game up. So I think they, they, they're they getting funding for another maybe six to ten months, maybe a year at the most. Uh, but they already have you know, uh, they've reached a few good stretch goals, which I'm excited about. Like they have a new class called the Hound Master or something like that, and uh, they've got uh, you know mini bosses that are going to be coming in. So that that's cool. Yeah. Oh, just one last thing, Tejas, you've been playing uh, Amalur. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? I am loving its combat and its upgrade system. Uh, the story is pretty standard. Uh, <laughs> the story uh, so, is you know, so, as close to garbage as it gets. Uh, yeah, it, it's all right. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, nothing. They did not put uh, a lot of garbage to that story. Yeah, like yeah, I mean, they probably, uh, supposedly they got a famous uh, like fantasy yeah, writer Salvatore. to write it. Yeah, yeah. R. A. Salvatore. He does a. He did all. The, I guess he just kind of phoned it in. I guess or something. <laughs> Or no, actually, uh, like I haven't read a lot like, of his it's stuff. It's an interesting universe, but the story is very, uh, it's very conventional. Yeah, like he hasn't like gone out of uh, or go- done something like so or really different where you know he's kind of uh, just surprising you. It's it, it's very uh, well, I won't. Yeah, it, it's it's something you've uh, you know you expect in high fantasy, uh, like all the. Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, tick boxes or or check Yeah, boxes all the ducks are in a row. Yeah. So in in that sense, it's fun. You know, there's nothing. You know, uh, you're like, oh my god, this is so amazing. But I'm loving the combat. It is really nice. It's really fluid and thought out. And yeah, I, I'm really enjoying that aspect of it. And I'm still in the beginning. You know, and I'm and the other thing I've noticed is that you pra- like you cannot walk in a straight line in this game. You always deviate to go uh, pick up uh, some plant yeah, that's yeah, shiny. Yeah. There's, always, there's always some side quest or the other that. Uh, Dude, like not even side quests. I'm I... talking about stuff that you can pick up. You just keep running around harvesting plants. <laughs> yeah, uh, like what? What was the about that? Uh, like I heard uh, the phrase "single player MMO" branded about a lot. So does it feel like that? Um, a little bit. I mean, you know, the quest line is very typical. Um, you know, typical RPG is like, oh, here's the uh, uh, here's the starting hey, area. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you were referencing a game I made. Okay, go on. <laughs> No, dude, I haven't played any of your games. <laughs> I can't reference them if I haven't played them. Um, no, uh, it, it's like very typical, uh, you know, just very typical where you kind of, uh, you know, the first uh, level is just, you know, learn the mechanics, run down this uh, corridor. Now you're in an open space ish where it's not completely open but the corridor is pretty wide where you have some choices and then i think it's going to slowly get you know larger so i can see how that uh how that description applies but i can't really uh say how true or false it is till you know i play it a bit more i probably only have like a few hours into into the campaign what class are you uh, currently, I'm playing a mixture of uh, magic and uh, uh, staffs, basically, and uh, d- uh, dual knives. Oh, okay. I'm I, waiting. I, you're like, I'm fun with the combat. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I'm an waiting. aside, I just uh, like want to say that I kind of envy Tejas's ability to play one game for so long, because I have like a one thirty game Steam backlog, and oh, I, I don't know where to start. So <laughs> yeah. at this point, like it for me, it's getting so weird that I, I like I think I'm almost at the stage where I'd rather replay a game that I've already finished than yeah. try something. <laughs> exactly. It's like. Oh, but like you see the the list of unplayed games, like you, you have installed them, but you've never launched them. And you're like, ah, oh, what the hell? I'm just going to play Civilization, and then yeah. you <laughs> just click Civilization. And, yeah. Then 25 hours later, you look at yourself and just get in disgust and go, oh, I feel dirty. Yeah, sort <laughs> of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like the Steam backlog problem. My God, like I'm I'm acquiring games at a faster rate than I can play them. It's it's like insane. It's like the it's like I don't gather gather enjoyment from playing games anymore. I gather enjoyment from buying them. And then looking <laughs> at your Steam list of unplayed games. Yeah. Uh, uh but seriously, like to, talking about the point that you just made, did you guys read Jason Broder's article about sales and how they're affecting? Yeah. Uh, Value and like yeah. our perception of games and stuff like that. Like, what did you guys think about that? Uh, I think he has a few good points about you know just generally. It, it's like what Arvind says that at a point you're more interested in getting the deal than actually playing the game. Which, uh, you know, f- from the long run, I think it hurts us as an industry. Like, yeah, uh, the like, fact that people are just interested in procuring the game that might work in the short term but in the long term what people are going to realize is that i have this large list of games i haven't played any of them and uh, let me play this thing on mobile <laughs> no i think like the guy uh... <laughs> wow dude you just <laughs> i just made a random jump of logic that made no sense at all yeah like uh, yeah you should go to work for a major publisher like you'll fit right in <laughs> no, it's not it's not that sense here's the thinking behind it right like i think people will say that they don't have the time anymore to play these long experiences that they're buying for pc and console uh, but they do have the time to play they have 5 minutes to play flappy bird or whatever right um, <laughs> so i think like the, the problem here is that like like jason order has the right set of facts but he kind of uh, gets to a wrong uh, uh, like you know like conclusion based on them like i think the problem here becomes that like games will have be so more biased towards Ah, uh, more distilled experiences like, ah, uh, like the the Stanley Parable lasts for like what two hours, three maybe, but it it has really it is really entertaining, very memorable. Like I think that sort of experiences will become more common compared to the like like Kingdoms of Amalur, where right. you have like a good ah uh, like the the basic experience might be very good, but it's just like there's hundred hours of it, and not many people have hundred hours to spare for a single experience. I think yeah, I I think definitely that's the direction in which uh things are going. But like it it uh, that kind of game will become hard uh to make if you're if you're making a system driven game like say FTL. Yeah. I don't know how you can deliver a small chunk of FTL so that it's still fun to a player. Yeah. Right? No, actually, yeah, that's pretty uh interesting because like what FTL does is you can save and quit at at any time, right? Like so, rogue likes have this thing. Where like it doesn't really matter. You can play five minutes of a rogue like. Like I have played five minutes of FTL, then I've gone to eat something, then I've come back. I've played five more minutes, and then so I don't. So FTL is pretty conducive to that kind of thing. Like ah, uh, I don't know, man. It's not. It it is always and it has been for most people that I've seen play that kind of game. It's been a more involved experience. Yeah, it, I don't think they could. Uh, it's something that. Uh... You know, like yeah, maybe you know you're fine with getting up and walking away and then coming back, but generally you don't want to do that because you know it it ruins your flow if that makes sense. You know, you kind of have a plan and then you get up, you go do something else, you come back, you're like, wait, where was I? And that's generally not part of you know just the general experience of playing that game either. So yeah, and I, I don't entirely agree on. on that point but i do see what uh, jason roar was saying about you know just general sales being you know uh just long run uh you know uh harmful just harmful in the long run but that being said i think he does go a little overboard by the end of the article where you know he's like uh you know that everything should change i i like his idea that you know some games start off 
cheaper for the people who want that early access and then it amps up slowly to a final price but um you know th- i don't think that's something that'll work for all games yeah also like the general thing like sales are it's unfortunately the way uh, marketing works is that sales are something every consumer likes now uh mm-hmm. it's just universally so ground into our uh, vocabulary and our uh, our understanding of the world around us that sales are a good thing and everyone wants to you know everyone wants a good deal hmm. so there's yeah, no I mean, way you getting at, you're getting rid of that basic, culture i mean at the most basic thing sales allow you to get that game you have always wanted for like a fraction of the price so i mean i can see the appeal it's not hard to see the appeal of sales oh sure you can see the appeal the guy who never plays full price for any game can see the appeal of a sale i'm shocked yeah, <laughs> yeah so at at like you are saying as if like you know you are some kind of like uh, like you know hypothetical like kind of person who wants to pay extra for everything in life you're like as somebody's like hey 10 rupees kilo ka tomato you will be like no 15 because jo farmer ne isko ugaya usne bahut mehnat kari so like that's not really wow. the thing right that that analogy is filled with so much bullshit i don't know where to I start know. play you buy at 75% discount when it's less than yeah. $5 when the developer is giving it away for this is what you say usually when a game comes out when the developer <laughs> gives it away for free i'll buy it yeah so like <laughs> so at no point did i and actually that's, that is, that is not it's not a surprise exactly. to me that no. you think that uh, like uh, the the like jason rohrer's sales for this is is not something that you think is a very great idea that's fine understandable yeah but like it's not really like, i am pretty sure a majority of people think this way and it's not even wrong to think this i think way. i see look i think from a consumer point of view uh, yeah of course consumers are going to think this way consumers want cheaper games that's fine i think as developers uh in the long run people are going to stop placing value on your product right if they end up with large heaps of games that they never play uh like the, then they're going to say hey i have i have 500 games i never play any of them i never play any of these things why do but i keep but like them? what is Because the price where it actually starts and the other yes. thing is other thing is you're devaluing your product by placing it like by selling it at 2 bucks a pop right nah that's not really true never no, no but like the point is like sales have been going on for like 5 6 years so when is the point do you think when people will stop paying money for games because it it hasn't happened till now but so will it okay but next now the big it... push is the big push is that most most people want pc game prices to go down right whereas cost of production of games is going up now uh, that's actually not true like uh, especially most consumers since, like, think that pc stuff. games are overpriced yeah because like i mean you often times don't want to pay 50 bucks for aliens colonial marines But, or some other okay, shit okay whatever <laughs> aliens oh, colonial no. marines that, skyrim that's that you call it it's a false like, analogy yeah. even if it's a good game people will say if it's if it's out at 60 bucks people will say this costs too much if it's yeah, out even at 20 or 30 dollars people say game. it costs too much man no i don't think like uh, i'll i my personal uh, because due to my income and stuff is 15 dollars like I don't complain for a price like I don't say okay ten dollars they are asking for too much greedy developers or whatever. So, I mean I have yeah, paid. Yeah, but like, see that's up, that's that's insane. I, mean, I paid forty dollars. In no other industry, in rate. no other industry, do people complain when prices go up year over year? Our prices have stayed flat. Sixty dollars is what the price has been since the since the NES. Sixty dollars flat. Know, like, people complain when prices go up for like all the time. Like, do you read news? People don't complain when prices go up for their cars. People don't complain when prices go up for a movie ticket over time. What 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 did a movie ticket cost when we were in school, and what does a movie ticket cost now? 
what is a dvd cost then what is a blu ray cost now like there's a huge difference in price people don't complain about that no like i i'm like i'm sure people complain about it like they cannot do anything about it that's another it's thing, not but... it is not okay, it is not at an industrial level where you will find reporters writing articles about how much video games cost or how much movie tickets cost it is uh, not at an organized level where people are sitting down saying and saying hey the price needs to come down this is too high no i'm not, I, like i'm i'm not sure where you're getting this from like have you not read like all the mehngai articles all the inflation articles mehngai articles are like, about are about the price of food arvin that's an essential yeah, so like, at, we need food not just we need food, food to survive like, like, don't need and video cars like, all of that stuff huh you know we don't like, need cars cars are a luxury item yeah so like so so what you're saying <laughs> is that like nobody deserves to complain about anything except the price no, of food i'm not product. saying that nobody deserves to complain about it i am saying i'm trying to make a point that you devalue your product right that was the point that i was making people have every right the consumer has 100% right to complain if they think it's too expensive then from their point of view they're right it is too expensive i am saying that as a developer as developers we also have to think from our point of view that are we devaluing our products are we making people think that this is only worth 2 dollars is not worth more than 2 dollars when we price our games that low when we put them in sales right that's the point i'm making you can't just jump the gun and keep shifting goal posts man i'm not sure like i follow your like <laughs> but okay yeah you're you're free to like say because like your your thinking is just like kind of weird you're like like because devaluing your product is just such a stupid thing like it's like like you know when like even like everyone the like es says we don't want to have sales on origin because it devalues our product the next day 75% off hello so <laughs> but okay again you're you're again you're shifting goal posts and you're you're like your analogy is filled with bullshit ea what? does something this, this stupid what analogy. does that have to do with me because you are also kind of like ea no 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 see that has nothing to do with me it has <laughs> absolutely nothing to do with me that's a bullshit analogy arvin you got i wasn't equating ea to you i was it, just trying to pass exactly. it off as a point it's not a point what but it is a point like because like you just said about like Like no devaluing your, pro- devaluing your product yeah, devalu- fact, i connected those two things people keep complaining about the fact that game prices are too high right it's something even you and i do when ea raise the price of their games in india by what a thousand rupees a pop it's something even you and i complained about right because yeah. they they use the excuse of the exchange rates uh, to the dollar when the rupees rupees like uh, rupee to the dollar was skyrocketing rupee was becoming 60 cents it was close to 70 rupees at one point right to a dollar and that point they they kept raising the prices because they had an excuse to increase the price something even you and i cribbed about but at the same time what i am saying is like our what we look at as the value of a game is is going down significantly as time goes by and that doesn't happen for anything else not at this kind of organized level and in the long term for almost any kind of creative entertainment product prices go up over time they're not supposed to go down over time and that hasn't happened here we our prices have stayed flat over time it used to cost 60 bucks when the nest came out it cost 60 bucks when the friggin the uh, xbox 360 came out and it's i don't know how much the new console games cost but like it cost the same it's still 60 i don't i've not heard of any major price jump to 80 or 90 or anything like that it cost 60 bucks right the rate has stayed flat and ea ea doing some making some bullshit statement with origin has nothing to do with what i am saying this is about are we are we by encouraging a culture where we say that a, where we encourage customers and encourage consumers to buy games only during the winter sale or only during these four sales that come out every year are we encouraging customers to think that this is the actual value of the game when i buy it yeah. in the sale and the rest of the year it's selling at a much more inflated value and it's not worth buying i don't think like but okay yeah whatever yeah like i'm not really in the mood to argue anymore so yeah whatever like we have basically <laughs> devalued games yeah dark souls 3 is going to be free oh, to play blah, 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 blah. okay okay so, You, you, yeah. you're, you're a sore loser, you know that. <laughs> no, the problem is that you are just so biased in favor of like the big publisher way of thinking that you just are like have bought so into the whole do, narrative of valuing games and stuff. This has nothing to do with big publishers. This like you are basically uh, like 
spouting their rhetoric and you like so expect me to be like what does it have to do with big publishers you do, you think this doesn't affect indie developers no it doesn't like every time the the really? sale happens like your earnings really? go up way more no, than what no, you would earn no, they before. don't all earnings go up for high profile indie devs they don't go up for all indie games across the block no when i unless everyone a battle, unless everyone that... lowers their price to 2 dollars a pop or something sales don't go through the roof man No, it because it, they went are, for me. Because like, people, I don't know. Like I'm huh? not exactly high profile either. They went for they went up for me when I put them in a bundle or when I yeah, put them but, in a okay. sale right. or something. Then, now quote how much you got paid every time your game sold in that bundle? Ten cents? Yeah, like no, not really ten, more like twenty or something. But yeah, like so, so. But in the end, I made more money, you know. So yeah, but. And on the other hand, right. on the other hand, people are going to start thinking that your game is only worth twenty cents, right? No, that's like the argument. That is the argument that Jason Rohde is making. That's the argument that I am making. No, yeah, you are wrong. Like because nobody, like the people <laughs> who wanted to buy my game for full price, bought it at full price. Lots of people have bought my game for full price. But like, there are many people who won't pay the price I actually wanted for my game. So what these sales actually do is that they get the people who are who are on the fence, and then and those people provide you extra sales. It's yeah, not like if I like, all like if I never the reduce problem, the price. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. All right, fine. If you're talking, you're talking about converting people who are across the fence, but it's not actually actually a conversion, right? They have decided in their head that this is the value of what you're making. When you put up, uh, we'll fight for food on green light. We'll fight for food is on green light, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what what was the comment that you told me that you got across the board? Ninety percent of the comments said what the first time you put it up on green light. Maybe they some that said some said something about like how I was gay and stuff. They said and like some people said flash said it, game and something. They said it was yeah. a flash game, right? Yeah. So. the first thing like the first thing that majority of the people who saw your game on greenlight thought was that a it's worth nothing because it looks like something in their head now that that construct in in people's heads that ha iski value 1 dollar hai isse zyada we are not willing to pay for anything like this it's not worth more than 1 dollar and then you have nothing to price like, your game like at, you say at 50 cents so that they don't And then you have to price your game at fifty cents so that people will buy it at all. That is harmful. That is harmful. People expect, like people expect quality of you know like Mass Effect and beyond now in terms of graphics, in terms of like the amount of functionality, in terms of gameplay. They expect that level of functionality and they want that level of functionality, but they want it for five bucks a pop, and that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in the real world. We can't afford to do that. There, there is a problem. It's not just with the big publisher. It's even with people like, uh, like small indie developers. This affects us in a bad way. If people start thinking that a value of a game is like one dollar, and for that one dollar, I am expecting all the quality in the world pushed pushed into it, that's not a good trend. In the long run, I think that's what Jason Rohde is saying. I, yeah, that's what I like. That's in in the long run, it's not a good trend. Just so you guys know, I've been enjoying listening to you guys go back and forth <laughs> without saying anything. Okay. Yup. <laughs> Arvind is just sitting and fuming somewhere now. This publisher-loving fucker is talking about his publisher-loving things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, close to that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty close to that. Yeah. <laughs> any any longer, and someone's gonna rage quit the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, like. Okay. okay. Um. Before you guys get at each other's throats, uh, what exactly have we been working on? Um. I, I, I can go first. I, uh, I can't talk about what I'm working on, but uh, I can say that I'm balancing something again. So that's kind of fun. It's been a while, so I'm enjoying looking at Excel sheets and numbers and wondering what exactly I'm doing again. Um. That is. <laughs> What about you, Arvind? I'm just working on Andres, and we have T-shirts, so buy them. 
Yeah, the t-shirts <laughs> look good, by the way. I saw the pictures. Yeah, yeah t-shirts, t-shirts and the buttons and stickers and stuff look good. I think unrest's overpriced, though. I think you should put it on sale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, like, yeah, like, that's the kind of overarching plan anyway. So, yeah. Uh, like just the price it and then put it on sale. Buy it for the same price, but think they got a deal. Right. Uh, as for me, uh, I've been working on my game. Uh, I showed it to a couple of people last week. Arvind was there. Got some yeah, good feedback. Is, it sucks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> Arvind seemed kind of impressed with it last week. I couldn't tell if he was like trying to fake it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a compulsive liar, so. Uh, it's, 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 no, you're not. That's the problem. <laughs> you're not a compulsive liar. You, you're genuinely <laughs> blunt. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but overall, it was good to finally get people to see it. it it's uh, it gives people give, gave me a pretty big boost. And yeah, working on that full speed again. Awesome. Well, uh, in that case, I think we can uh, uh, bid everyone a good night or a good day, depending on when they're listening. So, uh, yeah, goodbye, everybody. This was the Dead Horse Podcast.